All right, we're continuing in our series on the book of Revelation. This is week 28. Yes, we are nearing the end. So uh, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. That's what we're up to. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Imagine a world where righteousness and goodness were commonplace. We complain a lot about this world, about the evil in this world, people that do bad things and seem to get away with it, and all of the trouble in this life, in this world. But think about it. A world where righteousness and goodness are commonplace. A world where there is no injustice. Where everyone is treated fairly and with respect. A world where truth prevails. Can you imagine? <laughs> a world where truth prevails. Everything from the system of government to the system of education to the system of the economy to social circles, all of it operating in righteousness and godliness. Now just think about this. A place where you will live in peace and joy and complete health, where prayers like we just prayed won't even be necessary because everyone will be in complete health and live long lives. In the words of Louis Armstrong, what a wonderful world. Well, as Christians, you will get to experience that world. Praise God. It seems so foreign, but you will get to experience that world. It will last for eternity, but it will begin with a 1,000-year reign with King Jesus right here on good old planet Earth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, as always, for your word, how you have preserved it for us, and how you have uh, created this, this uh, body of Christ, the local church here on the earth. And given uh, gifts to people, uh, different gifts, and, and the gift of teaching and preaching to, to proclaim your word. And for us to hear it and learn it and apply it to our lives and see the increase. And I pray that that's what happens today. That you would teach far above my ability to teach and give us all ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord would like to teach us this morning. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you've been following along with each week, uh, we have already started chapter 20. If you haven't, all of the messages are uh, archived on our website. Just go to ChristFamily.Church and click Watch Online. All of the, web, uh, all of the um, messages are there on the website. But uh, as we've already seen in chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, an angel directed by God has arrest, arrested Satan, thrown him into the bottomless pit, and chained him there for a thousand years. Satan will be re rendered powerless for that thousand years. That, that's one of the reasons why it'll be such a wonderful time. Because Satan will be rendered powerless. And now at this time that Jesus has overthrown all evil uh, in what has become known as the Battle of Armageddon, which wasn't much of a battle at all. <laughs> you talk about anticlimactic, it, it took what? About a minute? Some battle. Jesus will establish his kingdom here on the earth for his millennial reign. Now, I don't know about you, but I've given a lot of thought to what that's going to be like. Now, think about this. Think about how much thought and think time we invest in things in the future. Our retirement. Not for me. I never want to retire, if he does. But um, not for a while. But we talk about it. If, if you're 50 or older, you probably talk about it too. You talk about your vacations. Where, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? 
What are we going to do this weekend? That I don't have to work. What, what do I want uh, as a party for my next birthday? Now that's a, this is a popular month for us. We have a bunch of birthdays this month in our family and in our church family. Now my daddy always said all great men were born in February. And I said, yes, I, that was me. I'm, mine's the 28th. We give a lot of thought. We invest a lot of thought into our future, things that are coming up. If we don't like the car that we're driving so much, we start thinking about the next one. What's the next one I want to trade up to? How do I have to pay this one down to trade it in and get a better one? We put a lot of thought into the future of this life, don't we? But I think we are seriously mistaken to just stop there. There is life after this life. I, I, I feel like I want to I wanna shake you and shake myself. I think we all need a shaking uh, to, to uh, be shaken and realize there is more to the Christian life than just life on this earth. There is life after what we call death. And you think, well, that, that's so far off. And if you live to be a ripe old age, you know, I want to live to be a hundred. But even a hundred's going to come before I know it. But we're not even promised that. You don't know when your life will end. But there is life after this life on earth. And we need to think about it. We need to invest think time, reasoning, thought about that afterlife. I've had questions like, where, where will we live? What, what are we going to do? Um, you may still have a job in this millennial reign, but guess what? I won't. <laughs> the Bible is very clear that there are some things that won't be needed anymore. And one is a preacher. Right? So, so my job is over when I die, and I, and I think, okay, well, then what am I going to be doing in heaven? What am I going to be doing after I leave this old earth? What will our relationships be like? If we're going to, quote, rule and reign with Christ, what or who will we rule over? So I wish there are a few more chapters describing this millennial reign with Christ, but in Revelation, there's only three verses. Chapter 20, verse, verses 4, 5, and 6. That's it. Now, there's a few verses we've already covered last week in the beginning of it, and next week we'll get to some at the very end. But as far as that millennial reign itself, that thousand years, we got three verses. <laughs> That's it. And guess what? I'm going to use the whole message today to cover those three verses because I think this is a pretty big deal. Let's start reading with Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 5. But the rest did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, one of the first things to understand is that Satan is incarcerated. So there is no evil tempter during this time. That, that scripture is very clear about. As opposed to what we have now, Satan roams the earth seeking whom he may devour. And Jesus said that that's, that's his job, that's his goal, to, to what? To steal, kill, and destroy. And I've expounded on that in some of our last 
a few weeks in the message that Satan is never your friend. You're never okay with Satan. Even if it seems like you're, you know, moving along just fine, just smooth, and what you know is outside of God's will, and you think everything is cool with Satan because you're doing something that he has tempted you to do that's like your buds now. Well, guess again. As we have seen, he, he lures you in with deception. He gets you um, almost addicted, really addicted to some type of behavior that's outside of God's will. And then when you just think that everything is going to be okay, that's not enough for him. He uses it to destroy you. His job is to kill, to steal, and to destroy but in this millennial kingdom, the presence of Satan is taken away completely. Now, if you're not careful, upon first read of verse 4, and I don't know if you've ever read this pass these three passages before and been confused by them. I'll admit that I have. <laughs> you know, I, from becoming a pastor, it put me in the position where I had to study it to really learn it and understand it. But I can remember when I was younger reading this and thinking, this, I don't get this. This is not what I thought was going to happen when I died or when the end of the world came or if the, the rapture happens and I go up in the rapture. rapture this, the way I read it, it, it didn't seem like what I, I thought was supposed to happen. It, it, it became very confusing to me. And if you're not careful upon first read of verse 4, you might think that only those who became Christians during the Great Tribulation will get to live and reign with Christ during this thousand years. Now, if you just look back over verse 4 again, if, if, you, don't, if you don't study it out, it, it kind of sounds like that's the people that it's describing. The people that uh, became martyrs during the Tribulation that reign with Christ. But, but that is... They do, but they're not the only ones. That's not the case. And there are two primary views of this passage, why it's worded this way, depending on which scholar, Bible scholar you follow or trust. And one is that um, God gives special encouragement to those who accept Christ under the extreme duress of such evil uh, during the time of the, the tribulation, even to the extent of execution. In other words, he names them specifically just to give props to them. And the other view is that this passage actually does refer to Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, including us, and the tribulation martyrs. Okay, I actually think both views are valid. I do think that he is including everybody, all of the, all of the Old Testament, New Testament saints and uh, the martyrs from the tribulation and that he is naming them specifically because of the, the great duress and extreme circumstances that they were under that they had to not only resist the Antichrist but to their death. Now I know we would probably all say I would give my life for Christ but saying it and doing it is two different things. <laughs> Now, I really believe I would, but I, I hope that I'm never put in that position. But these people were, and, and the Scripture calls them out. And verse 5 can be confusing if you don't study it thoroughly. It mentions the rest of the dead who will not live again until the thousand years is finished. So if somebody thinks that, that verse 4 is just talking about the people that were martyred in the tribulation for Christ that they're the only ones that rule and reign, and the rest, that would be us, you know, wouldn't, um, uh, would not live again until the thousand years is finished. That's not the case. To some, it sounds like the rest of the Christians who didn't die in the tribulation. Again, that's not the case. It means those who are dead that never accepted Christ. That's who it's referring to. And then there's that sentence, this is the first resurrection. That, that's a a problematic sentence. It doesn't seem like it should be, but unfortunately it's often cited by what is commonly called post-tribbers. We've talked about that before. Some people believe in a pre-trib uh, uh, rapture, some believe in a mid-tribulation rapture, and some believe in post after the tribulation that God raptures his church. My personal belief is I'm a pre-tribber, uh, okay? But for the post-tribbers that believe it happens after the Great Tribulation, this is a passage that they would cite. 
Uh, to say that the resurrection, referred here as, as they would say, the first doesn't happen until after the tribulation. But that phrase is not referring to an event, it's referring to a class of people. I've got a passage here to show you. This is Jesus speaking in John 5, 28 and 29. Jesus describes two resurrections. He says... Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and to those who have done evil, the resurrection of condemnation. Okay, so Jesus is describing these two resurrections. And the two events are separated by this thousand year period because the rest of the dead are not given their resurrected bodies until the thousand years were finished. And that's for them to appear at the judgment, okay? And again, I don't mean to belabor this, but I've, I can remember working through this myself, and I think I'm, I'm not the dullest knife in the drawer, not the sharpest either, but if I had trouble with it, you might be having trouble with it too. So let me just look back, look back at verse 5. It's in two parts and they, they, that they're, the fact that they're in the same verse is what causes the confusion. It talks about the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Some people think that it's referring to those that didn't live again until the thousand years were finished. I wish, who am I? I'm no Bible scholar, but I wish they would have separated the verses there and made it, uh, did not live again until the thousand years were finished, period, verse 6. New topic, this is <laughs> the first resurrection because what the first resurrection is talking about is the greater body of the passage. There's one sentence there talking about the rest, those who never accepted Christ, that they don't live again until the thousand years were finished. Have I, have I totally confused you? <laughs> it's, it's important to understand what's going on there because verse Five mentions two resurrections. Both believers and non-believers are resurrected to a suitable body. As Jesus said, believers to a suitable body for eternity in heaven. And non-believers a suitable body, unfortunately, for hell. And that's why he says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Okay? All right, so now that I've complained about only being given three verses about the millennial kingdom, I should tell you that there's actually many, many, many scriptures that talk about and describe this time other than these three. There are. They're not in the book of Revelation right here, but there are many passages. I would encourage you sometime, if you really want to give some uh, intentional thought to your future after this life, to Google it. Google scriptures about the millennial reign. And you'll see lots of passages in Daniel, lots of Old Testament references that, that describe this time. For example, Daniel chapter 7 tells us that the Old Testament saints will reign with Christ. Matthew chapter 19 verses 28 and 29 tells us that the apostles and those who followed Christ will reign with him during this time. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3 says that the New Testament saints will reign and rule with Christ. And here, of course, in verse 4, God makes it clear that the tribulation saints will reign during this time as well. So all of the saints in glorified bodies will rule and reign with Jesus. Say, that's me. That's me. Maybe look at your neighbor and say, that's you. If you're saved. <laughs> I think everybody in here is saved. So I think it's saved. That, that, that's all of us. All right, so I don't know how well I've described this or explained this, but the, the bottom line is if you are a Christian, this is talking about you. You will rule and reign with Christ. Now that's why I say it gets me thinking. I'm going to have some type of authority. I'm going to rule and reign with Christ. I'm going to be delegated some job, some, some area, some project, some, I don't know what, 
that, that I'm going to rule or reign over? That this is something to think about. And so I wanted to resolve that fact first that this is talking about you. You will rule and reign with Christ during this thousand years. So this begs the question, who will King Jesus and us saints be ruling over? Now, again, I, I don't want to belabor this, but all kinds of thoughts and questions come up. Well, it's like, well, if everybody that goes to heaven is a Christian, we're not going to be ruling over each other. I mean, who's, who's left to rule over? Everybody's good. <laughs> everybody's a Christian. I, I don't want to ask for a show of hands, but maybe you just nod at me a little bit. Has, have any of you ever wondered this stuff? Okay, I got a few nods. Okay, I feel better now. <laughs> I don't want you to start throwing eggs and rocks at me <laughs> for talking about something you're not interested in, but, but we all should be interested. This is talking about us, okay? In the beginning of this thousand-year reign, everyone in the kingdom will be converted saints. Jews and Gentiles who have come to accept Christ Jesus as Savior... But if you go on and read past our passage today, you will see that some stray from righteousness and require correction. Well, how is that? I thought everybody was saved and glorified and committed to Jesus. Don't you remember the passage that we've already read that says that Jesus will rule with what? A rod of iron. And we also know, and, and that, that's a, a simile similar to, you know, a rod of iron. And, but that, that rod is actually that sword that comes out of his mouth. We know that that's his word. His word should rule our lives now. But in this millennial reign, his word will be absolute law. And if anybody violates it, they'll be dealt with swiftly. Swiftly. He will rule with a rod of iron with his word, his laws, his precepts, his commands, his will, his way. All right, so who's, who's he correcting if everybody's is good? Maybe I'll just leave you sitting there wondering that for a minute. <laughs> he raises some questions. Scripture tells us that children will be born during this time. Huh? Huh? Say what? The population increases. If that's the case, who will bear these children if the saints in their glorified bodies neither marry nor bear children? Jesus said that. I'd love to be married to Miss Evie for eternity. I really would. Uh. <laughs> But it says we won't, we won't have that relationship. Uh, her and I won't. And, and, and if it is possible that glorified saints, how is it possible that glorified saints could slip away from Christ into sin? All right. Let me say that there are a wide variety of answers to these questions. Man. You want to spend a couple of days reading commentaries and different views about all of this? Just dig in. I would encourage you to. I did. I listened to videos. I, I watched videos. I, I reviewed several different commentaries. Uh, experts on the book of Revelation. And, it, and it's really interesting that the, the variation of different views. And I'm going to show you two of the most extreme one would be the view of what is known as an amillennialist. Okay, practice saying that. Amillennialist. A meaning non. Okay? A non-millennialist. In other words, people who do not believe in a literal millennium. They view these passages as being symbolic of the nature of King Jesus. There is that view. 
that this is not a literal event, that it is symbolic, okay? So that would be the amillennialists. And then there are the dispensationalists. Practice that one, dispensationalist. So millennial, remember, it just means a thousand years. A millennialist is someone who believes in the actual literal uh, time of something out in the future. An amillennialist would say it's not an actual event, it's just symbolic of the nature of Christ. Um, you, by the way, are a, a dispensationalist, not necessarily about the rapture. You, you dispense things in sequence of time. You, you dispense things in your house, okay? It's, it's, not, it's not a super spiritual word that you can't understand. Dispensation just means that it, it, it's chronological, it's linear. It, it, it's a timeline that started at the beginning and it continues going. And there's different dispensations along the way that God does. Okay? So the dispensationalists are people that see this scripture as a linear timeline of an actual event that's going to happen out in our future. So there are varying views all the way from the amillennialists to... Not only dispensationalists, but a variety of views from dispensationalists. Dispensational Bible scholars who have different views of this passage. And from the dispensational view, and by the way, this whole study is called eschatology. Oh, you've learned, if you ain't learned nothing else, you learned three big words in church today. Amillennialists, dispensationalists, and eschatology. Eschatology is, it just means the study of the end of the world, or the study of the end. All of this is eschatology. And there are eschatologists that specialize in eschatology. But from the dispensational view, there has to be some people that make it into this thousand year season who are Christians, but not in their glorified bodies yet. Is your head hurting yet? <laughs> Gosh, Paul, why'd you have to go here? Well, it's, it's not my fault. It's, it's the scripture's fault. We're just going line by line. And the, these are complicated ones. Think about it. Even though many tribulation converts are martyred for their faith, we know that, and even though the religious and economic Babylon have fallen, remember they, that big millstone that, you know, the angel tied around and cast it into the sea, economic and, and religious Babylon are gone. So those were the bad guys, the, 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 the people that uh, um, uh, practice sorcery and idolatry. But nowhere does Scripture indicate that the earth is totally void of humans at the end of the tribulation. Hmm. Now, I want to throw a disclaimer out. This is to my best understanding. Because I have no doubt that if you do study this, you're going to come across somebody who sees it differently. And, and there are some things about this that I, I would not argue anybody. I've talked about this before. I don't, I don't get into theological debates with people. Now, if somebody genuinely wants to learn, I'll sit and talk to them as long as they want to listen, as, or as long as they want to learn, or as long as they want to teach me if, if I'm taking a class and I want to learn something better. But I don't think that, you know, that even the Apostle Paul encourages us to avoid foolish disputes. Now, if somebody wants to get into a dispute over Christ, accepting Christ as their Savior, being the way to heaven, the only way to salvation, now I'll argue that all day long. That, that's the basic doctrine of our faith. But some of these interpretations of passages and exactly what they mean, I wouldn't argue. But I, 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 I feel very safe in knowing that I have accepted Christ as my Savior, that when I die, I am going to heaven. Whether I'm caught up in the rapture 
or I die on this earth and that I will slip into eternity and there is life after death. Now all these details, I'm doing the best I can. Revelation chapter 19, 21 makes it clear that after the beast and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire, quote, the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. But it doesn't say that there were no living converts. So it is possible that non-glorified Christians survive the tribulation and enter into the millennial kingdom and bear children, some of which will stray from Christ. There are the Jews in chapter 12, if you remember, that God spared and hid in the wilderness. Remember that whole metaphor of the woman being, you know, uh, taken into the wilderness? And Gentiles who escaped the Antichrist and became believers, but they enter the earthly reign of Jesus in physical bodies that can bear children and can still stray from righteousness to be corrected. And this is probably messing with your thoughts about what happens after you die or this millennial reign. And I'll tell you, you know I do a lot of counseling and I counsel people from time to time that, that just say, oh, I'll be so happy when I slip on into eternity and this life and all my troubles will be over. They're called is escapists. They have an escapist mentality. It's like the old a spiritual song that we had to learn and sing in, in chorus when I was a teenager. Soon all my troubles will be over. I'm going to live with God. And I'm coming right back to earth. I'm what? I've been wanting to get out of here. What do you mean I'm coming back? Yes. 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 Now, it's going to be very different. It's going to be very different, but that, that's why I'm saying we are thinking often. Our thinking is wrong. We're, we're, we're going to make a big U-turn. We're going to head that way, and we're going to come right back with Jesus. Back here. Now, we'll probably all be living in Israel, you know, the New Jerusalem, that, that, we're going to talk about that later. But we're, we're, we're going up and we're coming right back down. So now I've given you enough to discuss at your home groups this week. <laughs> I'd love to be a little fly on the wall and hear all the conversations. We're going to do what? How did he get that? What scripture was that? But I want to take you back away from the various views for a minute and all the details about the millennial kingdom. And I, and I want to ask this question. Is this really the first time we've heard about the kingdom? No. Turn over to Matthew 4 and verse 17 for a minute. Matthew 4, 17. <laughs> I hope I am clarifying more than I'm confusing. <laughs> Lord, help me. Matthew 4, 17. This is uh, not long after Jesus had been baptized and then taken into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. He began his preaching ministry. And what was his first message? Matthew 417. I'm even going to put it up here on the screen for you in case you couldn't find it. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is coming in the far off distant future. Is that what yours says? No. No, it's not what mine says either. This is Jesus' first recorded message. Message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand now. And this was 2,000 years ago when Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, 
was proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So how was it that the kingdom of heaven had come to earth? Because the king of heaven had come to earth. And the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Satan was given a certain amount of power. Prince and power of the ruler of the air. He can deceive. He can deceive you. But the earth is whose? The Lord's and the fullness thereof. And we have seen not only in our study of the book of Revelation, but in other messages that Satan can't just do anything he wants. Oh, listen, I one day, maybe when I get old and have lots and lots of spare time, I'm going to write a book called I Ain't Scared. <laughs> that debunks this mystery of Christians being scared of Satan. Let me say it one more time because it's powerful. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All of it. And the king of heaven had come to earth. And for three years of his adult ministry, Jesus put kingdom principles and kingdom realities on display. So in a sense, he was saying, you want to see what this afterlife is like? You want to see what it's going to be like when you live in heaven? Follow me around. Follow me around. I am the king of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm here. Watch me. So what does he do? He goes around and if people are sick, what does he do? He heals them. People that are discouraged, what does he do? He encourages them. When he sees evil and sin, what does he do? He deals with it with swift judgment and casts out demons. And I just, I just love it. I talk about it from time to time. He doesn't, you know, put his hands on them and wrestle and, and ask what their name is and communicate with them for, you know, uh, 30, 45, 50 minutes, you know, wrestling back and forth, you know, like we have to do because we're not as powerful as Jesus. He just says, go. And they're gone. That's what he does when he confronts evil. It has to flee when he speaks to them. He casts out demons. And we saw the demonstration of the Spirit's power overruling even the natural laws of this earth. He is king. He is ruler. He is the creator of all things. And listen, you have the principles of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have them now. This book sitting on a shelf collecting dust. <laughs> I'm, I'm being so emphatic with you about this because I'm be, I have been emphatic with myself as I study this. I don't think there's anything wrong with planning birthday parties and retirement and things like that. But I think that we are our focus, our percentage of think time and focus and thoughts about life are, are disproportionate. This is all temporary. <laughs> this is eternal. I'll confess that for my wife's birthday coming up, I must have spent 30 minutes on Amazon looking. I'm going to tell you what I got because I haven't got anything yet. I got a week. I'll spend 30 minutes on Amazon looking for stuff for my wife's birthday and it goes by like nothing. But sit down and study the principles of the kingdom of God that I'm going to live in for eternity seems so burdensome. What is wrong with our thinking? There is life after death. Man. 
forgive my <laughs> excitement over this, but it has really hit me this week. You have the principles of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You have them with you now. So I want to ask you the question, how are you ruling your life now? How good are you doing? Do you live your day, your week, and look back and kick yourself for all the things that you did that you, did, you shouldn't have done? I wish I didn't do it. I don't know why I keep doing that. All the way from, from serious sin to bad habits. I don't know why I'm always late. I'm always late. Why am I always late? You know, how well are you ruling your life now, in this life? And you say, but Paul, you don't know my circumstances. The enemy's been after me. Is this like the old Flip Wilson statement? The devil made me do it. it wasn't my fault. Which I, by the way, looking back, I think that was a bad cultural influence. I used to laugh at it. Remember watching that with my dad? We would laugh. The devil made me do it. Right? Well, I think it was a, a, negative, a negative message to society because people began to not even take responsibility for their own mistakes because the devil made me do it. How well are you ruling? And blaming it on the enemy... Long has man blamed Satan for his sin and rebellion. But don't you see that even in... Now listen to this. Listen. Don't you see that even in the glorious millennial kingdom when Satan's deception is non-existent and we're living in a perfect environment, some people will still stray and need to be corrected by Jesus. Who are you going to blame it on then? Ain't no devil around. No influence of evil. He is bound in the bottomless pit for a th this entire thousand years. People that live in a perfect in environment where truth and justice and goodness and godliness prevail. There's no sickness. There's no deception of evil. And people still stray. So, to me, this, this tells me that I've got to stop passing the buck. And I've got to stop playing the victim uh, uh, to my circumstances. Well, you just don't know. I would do better if. I would do better if. I would do better if I lived somewhere else. I would do better if I was married to somebody else. You just don't know my circumstances. You just don't know how the enemy is after me. This, this is a perfect environment and people still stray. To me, this is a message that we need to stop playing the victim. You have dual citizenship now. It's not marked on your passport, but you have it now. You're a citizen of the United States of America, but as Christians, you are even more so, more so citizens of the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. You are citizens of heaven. This life, short. <laughs> this citizenship, short. That citizenship, there's, there's, I can't stretch my arms far enough. Last forever. And the day will come that you have a glorified body and sin will sway you no more. But now, now is the time to prove your love and devotion to Jesus. What did he say? He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will rule well over yourself. You will rule well in this life. I don't have time to get into it now. I got to close, but I, I, 
I think that there is a connection. You know, we're not saved by our works, but there is, there's a good amount of scripture that says that our life in heaven will be impacted by our life on earth. There will be rewards. I think this ruling and reigning uh, it's my personal opinion. You've got to take this with a grain of salt, but it's my personal opinion that some of the delegation of that authority of ruling and reigning will, will be based on how well a person ruled and reigned in this life. I think it's extremely significant how well we rule and reign. That's why this soon I will, you know, trouble will be over. I'll get me out of here, Lord Jesus, come. Come take me, get me out of here. I can't take this old earth no more. That's why that's bad thinking. That's bad thinking. I'm very sympathetic to people going through difficult times. I spend countless hours a week helping people through those times. But it's bad thinking to think that I want to just get out of here. And get on into heaven. Because I'm coming right back. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. That's the blessed assurance. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Would you stand? You think you're going to escape this world and slip into eternity? That's not affected by your life here on earth now? Think again. We've got to be eternity minded. This is going to be an awesome time ruling and reigning with our King Jesus for 1,000 years. And then a wonderful, glorious eternity in heaven with him for eternity. So I want to end by asking that question on the screen again. It's, it's, it's the takeaway. It's what I want you to think about this week. How are you ruling your life now? Father, I thank you. Even for a difficult word. Even for passages that are hard to understand. A challenge at least. Oh, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us understanding would illuminate the scriptures in a way that become real to us. But above all of the details of the particulars of this millennial reign with Christ, I pray that every one of us would realize that the kingdom of heaven is at hand right now. And that we have the principles of the kingdom of our King Jesus in our hands. These Bibles, these precious words of God to lead us and guide us and help us to rule well even in this life. I pray that this would be a great challenge to all of us, myself included, to rule and reign in this life over the challenges of this life, over the, over the sin in this world, over the temptations, over the challenges and, and tribulations that come along. That even in spite of those things, we won't become victims of our circumstances. We will rule over them well. Not by our own strength, but by the principles of our King Jesus. Help us, Lord. Help us. As we transition now into our time of fellowship, I pray that you would bless the food. We know that you have provided it. So we ask you to bless it and that the fellowship would even be sweeter. That it would be a wonderful time of fellowshipping with our brothers and sisters. And Father, as we open the altars at the end of the service now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would compel those that need prayer to come, come and let us pray for them. Whether it's for salvation or for healing or, or for a greater faith or believing with them for anything in their lives. That they would... They would open their lives up to your ministry this morning and come to the altar and be prayed for. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed, but the altars are open. If you need prayer, you come on down and we'll stay as long as anybody needs prayer. God bless you.